I'll do it there. All right, welcome everyone. I'm just here to introduce Rick. I'm not your main speaker, but my name is Ginevra Wetmore. I am the program director at Sustainable Woodstock. And this is our third event in a three part species or in a three part series focused on biodiversity and building organic matter in soil and no till and pollinators. It's been this really fun uh, three part series that we're hoping to kind of pick back up again next spring and summer and uh, focus on as part of our organization. So it's very exciting for us. I'm very happy we're all able to come, especially after all the flooding. We had to cancel last week, so it's really great those of you who are here can make it. I, I'm kind of using this event and the other events I had planned as like an opportunity to look to the future and to plan for things that are hopeful and exciting amidst everything that's happened in the past week and a half. So I hope you can maybe take that with you too. Um, they, many thanks to uh, Jeannie and Steven for hosting this event at their private home. This is really kind. And there are some fun examples here of gardening and nomo and kind of some other techniques you can use in your own home. And I think that's it. And I can introduce Rick if there's not anything else pressing. So I'll go ahead and introduce you here. Rick, I've got his bio to read. Rick retired to Vermont in 2007 following a 28-year career directing the Rhode Island Natural Heritage Program, the State Biodiversity Inventory and Conservation Program. He has taught courses in ecology, endangered species, conservation biology, and backyard biodiversity at the University of Rhode Island, Rhode Island School of Design, and for the Native Plant Trust Certificate Program. He is currently propagating native plants at Ragged Orchid Farm. So I will um, transfer my microphone over to Rick and then we'll hear from him. Um, all right, well, thank you all for coming. Um, <clears throat> let's see, where do I begin? Um, I, I guess I don't have to begin with too much of an introduction. I really want to um, just sort of, you know, dive right into this. Um, it, uh, it's a talk that's centered on biodiversity um, and something that I've been involved with for close to 40, more, 40 or more years now. Um, you know, and originally I got involved with it as um, uh, you know, we're all concerned about particular species, um, endangered species, and and, 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 and and mostly species type work. And and I've done a lot of interesting stuff on a lot of interesting, different things that many of you 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 you've really never heard of. And, you know, really, you know, it's uh, and you know most you don't need to know them. <laughs> They're just uh, you know like cool things that um, you know are fun to talk about. Um, but you know, most of that type of work, you know, things like the that was done by the Nature Conservancy and whatever, is sort of done, as I like to say, out there. You know, everybody sort of thinks in the back of their mind that sort of biodiversity sort of means things like, you know, like coral reefs and tropical rainforests and places where there's, you know, concentrations of rare, cool things. Um, you know, but in fact, biodiversity is literally everywhere. You know, and 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 and, and without biodiversity, you know, you know, none of us would be here. I mean, of course, we're part of biodiversity, but we depend on all of that rest of that biodiversity to sort of, you know, as E.O. Wilson used to say, you know, it's the little thing, you know, that run the world. You know, that's what you know. Most of that biodiversity is, is you know, is, is, you know arthropods and insects neat things like that. Or at least, you know, people like me think they're neat. Um, so I'm, I like to convince, try to convince people that they're also neat because, um, you know, because they are important and because they are disappearing and, um, you know, we need to think about, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing. And because biodiversity is everywhere, people, people like you and, and you know, and people with anybody who has a you know, a quarter acre piece of land or, you know, or, or whatever, you know, can do things to help conserve biodiversity, you know, because there are important things that live, you know, on your properties. Um, and I'm going to talk specifically a little later about, you know, 
you know, a major one of those, which is the fact that we know that birds are declining. Um, you know, a couple of weeks ago in the talk we had here, um, you know, Alicia talked about the fact that, you know, I know about, about a third of the North American breeding bird population has disappeared in the last 50 years. What's most disturbing about that is that it's spread out among, pretty much among all species. So it's not just, you know, the ivory bill woodpeckers of the world and that kind of thing. You know, it's the Baltimore Orioles, you know, which has declined about 30 percent. Um, you know, and other common birds. And we're going to talk about the reasons why these common birds and these birds that depend on your yards, you know, why are they declining? You know, because nobody's nobody's come up with a good explanation for that yet. Everybody likes to say, well, it's the, it's the, you know, it's because of the habitat. It's the loss of habitat. You know, but we're talking about you know species that live in places just like this, and there is plenty of this. You know, to go around. So why are these things declining? So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so the the, folk, the the basis of of the talk, and when we're looking at biodiversity, is that we want to think of our properties, or you know, whatever, how big, however, you know, small they are, um, as ecosystems, because that's what they are, and that's and you know, on the sheet is what I you know tried to you know just give you a rough idea. This is you know just basically going back to you know to eco 101. Um, you know, if you remember those days, you know, high school biology or whatever, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, just a, a simple idea that, you know, translates to every ecosystem. So, you know, and so we can think about, you know, this, this, this uh, you know, arrangement, so to speak, you know, think about it in your own yards and, 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 how, it, and how this all actually works. <clears throat> so, you know, any ecosystem, you know, is basically, you know, a collection of plants and animals, you know, that, you know, and uh, within a f particular physical environment. The plants are the producers. You know, we got producers, consumers and decomposers and the plants, the plants are the producers. They're the ones that are that are making all the food. They're the ones that are eating. Uh, none, none, they're not eating. It's, it's, it's what everything is eating them. You know, pretty much all plants are eaten by something. <clears throat> and uh, so, you know, that's, uh, you know, this transfer of energy from plant to whatever is eating it. <clears throat> and there are a, a, a variety of, uh, you know, when we think of herbivores or, you know, things that eat plants, you know, we need to think about, you know, it's not just the leaves. It's, you know, every pretty, pretty much every part of the, of the plant is, is food for something. So that little rundown there, which talks about, uh, you know, just some examples of, of all that. Uh, and we'll get, yeah, we'll get back to some of the examples later. And then consumers, consumers of the herbivores, of the, of the animals, uh, you know, that are eating the, eating the plants. You know, animals eating animals. <clears throat> and examples of those, you know, predators we all know about, you know, just some Again, everything on there is anything that eats an insect, <clears throat> so to speak. Parasitoids is an interesting group um, that you really should get to know more about. Um, the fact that they're mostly wasps um, is probably what keeps people from, you know, really giving too much thought to parasitoids. But parasitoids are really important as pest control agents in, in your gardens. Uh, uh, not they're not parasites, um, but um, you know a, a good parasite doesn't kill its host. A parasitoid um, ends up does killing its host, not right away, but what it does is the wasp lays the egg on the caterpillar, and then the, the egg you know hatches. The caterpillar gets stung. It's put into a, you know a, a deep sleep, so to speak. And the hatching wasp comes out and consumes it, you know, and grows to be the thing. And so eventually, of course, the caterpillar dies. But there's a there's a whole wealth of um, of interactions amongst insects. So so if we think about this. There are in the average garden, um, 
probably one of the most numerous insects um, is going to be moths, which means that most of what's in your yard are caterpillars. And especially in yards with big trees and leaves all the way up there, you've got, you've got different species of, cat, of caterpillars and moths in different layers of the forest. You've got pretty much a moth for every, for every species of plant that you have. Um, yes, you could probably have you know, 200, 500 species of moths in, in this yard, which means there's a lot of caterpillars up there. And the way they, they you know, that, that, you know, you keep populations of caterpillars down is, is that, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're either predated on or they're impacted by parasitoids. And that's what keeps caterpillars in check most of the time. Unless you get a caterpillar that's sort of just like, you know, out off season that's not a native species. So, so gypsy moth or whatever we're calling it today. Um, is uh, you know renowned because it came to the North America without its predators and without its parasitoids. Mm -hmm. You know we really didn't get to start controlling that until we started importing some of the parasitoids to, to work on. And then the other thing that's really one of the most important parts of, of the ecosystem of your yard, you know, is you know what we group together as the decomposers. I mean, this is vital. This is vital stuff. You know, these are the these are the things that take that break down all of the different kinds of waste products and return all those nutrients back into the soil. And it all goes around and around and around. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, so there's a whole mess of these things. Um, you know, not you know all of them insects, but you know a lot of soil organisms. And, um, you know that. You know, you you see when you when you garden, you know, but centipedes. Most of them are pretty pretty small, too small to see. So uh, you know, you're not going to encounter them that much. So so that's yeah, that's you know sort of the the, the idea of your basic ecosystem, <clears throat> and uh, you know of, of any ecosystem. And so you can sort of use this as a guideline. So if you want to garden for biodiversity, um, you know, and sort of you know using this as, as your guideline, um, is it is, 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 there's a basically just you know a couple there's there's two things I say generally there are two things um, to consider you know when gardening for biodiversity, and it's really simple. It's very, you know, very, very simple. So the first one is, is just you increase the diversity of your plants. <clears throat> and hence, you know, that's why we're going to talk about how, how you go about doing that. But Jeannie has done, done this in, in, you know, in her particular way, which is, you know, which is a great way. It's not the way everybody's going to do. Um, some people are going to do more. Some people are going to do less. You know, but whatever you do to increase the plant diversity in your yard, um, is a good thing. Uh, that, you know, and, and so we'll talk about that in, in a second. The other thing, the second thing, is uh, is to stop using chemicals um, in any form. And we'll talk about some of that. You know, uh, you know, there are you know, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll talk about some of the alternatives for you know for those. Um, then we'll talk about some of the impacts that we, you know, that are really sort of sneaking in under the rug, you know, that was that was sort of missing in the, in the whole pesticide issue. Um, so, uh, 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 plant-wise, um, we 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 um, you know the other thing about biodiversity we have become, um, you know. Uh, uh, we, we know about the biodiversity crisis um, by the, by other kinds of crises. Well, you know some of the crises that are sort of uh, you know part of the biodiversity crisis. So, so that, as we know, there's a there's a there's, there's a, a decline in pollinators. Um, there's a decline in, in butterflies, and there's a decline in uh, birds. Um, and um, there's probably a couple of others. There's a decline in plants. 
there's a couple of others that you probably have heard about. You probably have really never heard about the fact that there's a decline in dung beetles. Um, you know, pretty dramatic, actually, to tell you the honest truth. Um, you know, and or you know, and, and, and again, you know, I mean, it's it's tougher to care about you know the, the decline about dung beetles than it is the, the decline about Baltimore Orioles. But you know, it, it is it is happening. Um, so, um, so plant-wise, um, uh, we need to think. We need to we need to go beyond the box with with just the pollinator issue, <clears throat> because all of those uh, because a, a lot of there are a lot of other insects that aren't pollinators, you know that are that are that are feeding on nectar. You know they use that as a main source of their food supply. Uh, many of the wasps that are the parasitoids are feeding on nectar. Um, there are all kinds of other insects feeding on nectar. There is a mosquito that feeds on nectar. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's known to be a pollinator of an orchid species up in the, up in the Green Mountains. Um, so yeah, you can get pretty much anything can be a pollinator, but there are a lot of other things that, you know, that come for that nectar and they don't really, they don't really pollinate. Butterflies, for instance. Um, aren't really great pollinators because they just take that tongue and they stick it down the tube, you know. And, you know, they don't want to touch anything except the nectar that's there. Suck, suck that up and get out of there, you know. And they don't, you know, no pollen attached to them. So, um, but you know, but they're using the nectar, and so that's you know, we need to think about not just the things that are you know, going to you know pollinate. Because all these other things are really important too. And so you can select plants that will um, that you know that will satisfy one or two butterfly species, for example, or one or two bees. Or you can find some plants that are really um, uh, 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 they're used by a wide variety of, of things. And one of the things in my, in, in, so, so what, what I'm doing now, currently now, is I, I do, uh, you know, now that I'm retired, I do all my research now in my own garden. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, what I'm primarily doing is, is I'm trying to pack in as many, <laughs> as many species of plants that I can. And then I, um, um, and then I, and I go out and sample what's, um, you know, what's feeding on those plants. Um, and, uh, so, and so I'll take a camera, I'll take a point and shoot camera and walk through the garden for about an hour. And anytime I see a flower with, a, with, a, with an insect on it that's feeding on it, I click its picture. And then I just keep going, I'm going around the garden and clicking pictures like this. And at the end of the day, I've got a collection of maybe a hundred photographs that have the date, the flower that it's feeding on. And hopefully I can get, identify the species, you know, when I send it, maybe send it off to somebody else. So what I'm doing is trying to collect data on, you know, what are the best plants? Um, and so some of them are, you know, I don't, I, they're not actually listed in the, uh, you know, the best plant that I consider. They're not listed in that butterfly list. Um, you know, that, which is also, you know, another thing I want to mention, but, um, and I'll talk about some of the other ones. So the butterfly list, you know, we think about, again, we're thinking about plants for pollinators and we're thinking about, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, and, and thinking about butterflies, you know, as pollinators. Um, and, and, and so what are the most important plants for uh, butterflies? And they're not necessarily the ones that the adults feed on. It's the ones that the young caterpillars feed on. That's why milkweed is really important for monarch butterfly. You know, that's one of the obvious ones. You know, but most butterflies, are, you know, a lot of butterflies are pretty strict about what, you know, what their what their con you know, caterpillars are consuming. The adults are looking for those plants when you see them flying around a lot of times. Um, you know, they're looking for the larval food plant. So, you know, if they don't find it, then they're just going to, you know, they're basically just going to pass through the yard. <clears throat> they might stop and, you know, and nectar on something, but, you know, they're going to go off and look for someplace else to, you know, for the young lady. So that's it. 
that's just a, a key to, a, you know, if you want to, you know, attract some butterflies. There's some kind of cool ones on there that not. I just point out the one, um, pipe vine swallowtail. Um, there are probably uh, no more than half a dozen records for this in Vermont. Um, it's what we call a vagrant. Um, they, uh, there's a lot of vagrant butterflies that come up from the south um, in the fall. And uh, so this particular one, you know, will, uh, will come up occasionally. Uh, it would be found on things, you know, if you have a pipe vine, you know, growing in the yard, which most people don't because it's, it's kind of tough to grow. But if you want to see a pipe vine. And this is one to think about. Um, this, is a, this is a climate change thing. You know, this is, um, you know, potentially this species, you know, all it needs to do is get up here early enough to lay <clears throat> some eggs on, you know, on somebody's pipeline, and that thing, you know, could eventually, you know, pull its range up. So, <clears throat> so, let's see, what else about plants? Let me just, can I borrow your sheet just for a minute? Yeah, this one here. Um, I just wanted to mention, <clears throat> So I tried to um, I tried to, to list the common butterflies. There are there are you know this this whole realm of larval food plants and whatever is really very interesting because most of the of the species of butterflies that are rare and really in need of conservation are rare because their food plant is rare. So the carnivore blue butterfly over in New Hampshire. Um, feeds on wild lupin, <clears throat> not the lupin that you see growing on the highway or that grows in your gardens, but the real wild lupin um, that needs sandy barrens to, to grow naturally. And so that's why that's a rare species. But so that's why I say, you know, when you garden for biodiversity, what you really need to do first is look around you and see what what do you have for habitat around. You know, what can I support that's around me or what, you know, what can I mimic or what can I, you know, so if you happen to live in New Hampshire next to the Pine Barrens, you know, um, you know, you would probably have a very sandy soil and you could probably plant wild loop and, and actually, you know, help benefit, you know, that particular butterfly. And there are other, you know, there are others out there which, you, you know, you can think about depending where you are. It's good to, Kind of fun stuff. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, okay. So, just one b briefly more as far as is, con is conducting gardening, you know, for you know, is, you know, so diversity of plants. Well, one thing that Jeannie has done is to let her lawn grow. Uh, and when you go by there, you will see things that have come up on their own, you know, flowers and, and you know, there is quite a diversity of things that, you know, this has just happened, this just this one season so far. So uh, now we wait to see what happens next year, you know, that will be really cool. So she's kind of, you know, she's done that and she's, you know, sort of done the same thing, not let that patch up on the hillside grow. And then, um, and then we've put in a, a small patch of perennials over yonder um, that um, you know you can you can check out on your way out. Two of the plants that well, I'm going to tell you one plant. I don't want to get involved in too much more about plants because then I'll just go on forever. Uh, but when people ask me what my favorite plant is for, uh, I, you know, not you know they'll ask me is, is you know what's your best plant for pollinators. And so I'll say my best plant for, well, for pollinators and everything else that loves this is a plant called uh, mountain mint. Uh, there's some of it growing over in, in, in the garden over there. Um, the scientific name is Pycnanthemum. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a member of the mint family, which a lot of good plant insect plants are members of the mint family. And that's, I think, one thing I wanted to mention, and, and lastly about plants, is when you, these things, what we call our yards, we're calling them ecosystems, um, uh, we, we, we have to realize that, of course, this is not 
the ecosystem that was here, you know, before we came here. Um, and, you know, it's a very changed ecosystem. And so there are ecologists now that, you know, recognizing the importance of these ecosystems, we, we're, we're, calling them, we're calling them novel ecosystems. And it, it's sort of because, um, you know, there is a certain percentage of, of plants in this community, in this ecosystem here, that, that were not here originally. They're they're not they're not invaders, you know. Although there are some that are invaders, but they're 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 uh, alien species. They're introduced, um, however we want to call, them, brought here by the Europeans, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and um, and they have become part of of this ecosystem. Um, there's really no reason to get rid of it, you know most of them. Um, they do actually, you know, support pollinators, you know, clover and, and, uh, and, and all kinds of things. So we don't necessarily really need to be that strict about native plants. And, and, and believe me, you're talking to somebody who you know, grew up on native plants, <laughs> or professionally grew up on native plants. Um, and native plants, yes, if we're out restoring a habitat, that has either zero or a very low percentage of introduced plants, you know, or we're trying to, you know, to restore as a native plant community. Yes, we're going to use native species, but you're not restoring a native plant community. You know, you want to use the things that work. So things like anis hyssop, which is also over there, which is not native here. It's native from the Midwest. But it's a great plant. It's a, it's, 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 you know, it's a, you know, I, I, I could go into a big story about each individual plant. I'm not going to do that. Uh, you know, but all of the mints, you know, but most of the mints, many of the mints are all introduced plants. They're all brought here by the European. They're all great. They're all great bee plants. So, um, where are we working for time? We're at, a little, we're just at six o'clock. Okay. Good. Um, any quick questions? <laughs> yes. What did you say about the minute? They're great bee plants. Bee. 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 Uh, that was sort of done like um, uh, using the basic concept of no-till. Um, uh, last fall, last fall, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, we basically came in, I, I came in and used big sheets of cardboard and laid it out in, in, in the size of what that is. Uh, and then I got um, uh, bags of compost. I think there may have been about 10 or 12 bags, I think. I mean, I could, if we had made it a little bigger, I could have gotten a, you know, a load of something in the back of my truck, but it wasn't that big. And so I got a load of that. And then I, so I covered all of that, covered all the cardboard with about two inches of that. Uh, and then uh, dug holes, you know, punched holes in the, uh, in the cardboard, through the cardboard. And um, and dug holes, and uh, put in the put in the perennials. I put in about I don't know seven or eight perennials, um, and you know and so this is just you know before so they all you know went, so you know the grass is going to die and whatever and the grass is not going to come back because it's you know it does come up weeds pop up that popped up in the middle of that because you get you know, pieces of it but you know the cardboard breaks down you know it all adds organic matter and uh, you know that's how that was done. How long did you wait after you laid the cardboard and then put the compost on top? Is there a period of time that's best to wait before you dig down and put your perennials in? No, no, no I didn't wait at all. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, um, and is the goal for that to be like a seed sort? Like, will it will seeds from those perennials move around, or is that just like a focal point? Uh, the, the, uh, there are a couple of plants in there I selected because they will spread, like the mountain mint. 
Now the mountain, wait, let me just continue with the mountain, because you asked. <laughs> um, so that's right in the middle of the thing. That will spread. It's a mint. Yeah. So it will spread. And that's actually a good thing, because the more of it you have, um, and here's why it's so good. Um, it, it, it flowers late. It isn't, isn't actually flowering now. But if it flowers like a very late flowering, well, it'll be flowering in another couple of weeks. And it will flower continually through October. Um, it has a cluster of flowers. I don't have the, I had a picture here that showed it, but I don't, didn't bring it. It has a cluster of flowers. There may be 50 or 60 flowers in that cluster. And they don't all flower at the same time. Mm. You know, they flower all, you know, intermittently. So the whole cluster, it takes like, Three, two or three months for that whole thing to flower. But you get, you know, there's such a number of them in the whole patch that, you know, the, 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 you know, the bees and everything just go crazy going between all of them. It's, you know, it's a new flower every day. <laughs> it, oh, and the other thing about it is it's, it is a very strong mint and the mints as general will repel the air. Um, and this one, it's, a, it's the strongest smelling you know, you can go over there later and, and smell this, and you agree it's the smallest, the strongest selling mint. Yeah. Are all the mints late blooming like that, or is it just that kind? No, they're all no. They're I I have spearmint that's coming flowering now. Uh, yeah, no, they. It's such a big family. I mean, you can get stuff all through the year. Okay. Yeah. Well. Okay. That's that's maybe a question after my next section. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. I was okay, just wondering more. what other perennials you chose to uh, plant in there. Um, there are two different Joe Pye weeds. Mm -hmm. um, um, I thought I, I, I uh, um, the, uh, rattle. Have you heard of rattlesnake master? Mm -hmm. It's it's a it's it's not a native plant by any means, but it it's just cool. I just I like things that are odd as well. <laughs> it's very odd. Yeah. Very odd. Um, there's also a penstemon over there. Um, and um, I think I, I meant to, to plant marsh milkweed, but I'm not sure if it, you know, any more. Yeah, milkweed. Okay, last one. So last question. <laughs> yeah. I have young children, so I have limited time, and I'm new to this. Okay. If I had a bag of that pollinator seed and I did the no till mulch compost and I just threw that bag down, would that be sufficient? Uh, well, I'll tell you. There's, I use one of those bags on Jeannie's lawn up there that um, you can see how all that gravel gets washed down there, or go, you know, gets plowed into the beginning of her lawn. So I scrape that up and put that seed down in that spot there. So all the really light green that you see there is is that mix. Um, it's 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 probably not going to uh, you know get big. It's a perennial mix, so they may just come up this one year, but they may not flower until next year. But yeah, you could you could do that. Hmm. Okay. Um, so. Uh, let me go quickly. I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to belabor this next one. Um, but it is for for, for me is becoming um, well, one of the most important things um, that I've begun to really work on and, and talk about. Um, and it's the pesticide issue. Mm -hmm. um, and the. Uh, anything to bring in? Yeah. What is it? Are you hearing? Yeah. Quick, yeah. turn that off and see if they can hear. Because I'm not sure what to do with that. See if they can still hear you. Yeah. Can you still hear me? Okay. Yeah. 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 Right. yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. 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 Um, um, and, and, and basically, um, I mean, it's, it's, you know, pesticides, you know, what comes before pesticides is 
you know, our impression of pests. Um, and, and, uh, and, you know, what, you know, what is a pest? What is, you know, what, uh, you know, all kinds of issues. You know, what is, you know, uh, you know, and all things become involved in it. You know, I, you know, and it goes all the way back to the, you know, the only good bug is a dead bug generation, um, which is there is still a lot of that around, you know, because there are people still, and you know, there are even more and better and more variety of these things out there. So this is this this is the bug zapper. You know, you know, if you're sort of looking curiously, that's good because if you've never seen one before, that's that's a good thing. Uh, but uh, uh, so this is the thing that so this has a black light in it, ultraviolet light, um, and um, you know before I disconnected the wires on this, uh, the wires were connected to the grid uh, inside in that cone that thing looks like it's coming inside there. And anything that flew in there would be get fried. Uh, um, the bigger thing you know, would, would make a nice loud crackling sound, um, <laughs> which, which when you read the reviews on these, you find people saying, "Hey, that's a really great item. It makes a great crackling sound." You know, especially when the big moths go in there. You know? uh -huh. <laughs> uh, I, so I use this. I got I got this. I get these at yard sales. And I disconnect the wires, and then I use these to sample moths at night. Um, it's a it's a great tool because that's what you know all you know in, uh, entomologists have been using these for years. You know that's black lights. You know, but you know mm -hmm. buying you know like a hundred dollar black light. You know, I got this for like five bucks or something. <laughs> so, but that's so so those are still out there. Um, it, 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 it's hard to say. There are actually some places, campgrounds and whatever, that um, forbid the use of those. So, in any event, uh, you know, you can get, take them camping or whatever. But more importantly, um, the, the, um, the, the insect issue has really come to the forefront with the development of this new generation of pesticides. So, that we generally call pyrethra. And there's the neonicotinoids too, but that's a, that's a different subject um, because the, the neonicotinoids don't come <clears throat> in things like this. So this is a uh, company spectricide, maker of triazicide, insect killer for lawns and landscapes. So it's not just for lawns, for landscapes. Kills 260 plus listed insects by contact. So this is essentially, yeah, it's an insect killer. This kill will kill any insect, any insect. You read the list on here. But I love the labels on them. You know, they talk about, you know, different kinds of insects, you know, and they list and, and they list caterpillars. You know. Well, you know, there's another. I don't know. You gotta add, you know, like 400 or so of these figures even just to get the caterpillars. Never mind all the other things you talk about. Uh, so that's kind of confusing. <clears throat> but um, so anyway, um, this this cost oh. me, and I I know I bought it. You know, I took it off the shelf so nobody else would get it. No. <laughs> I'm just going to hoard it and use, use it for, for demonstrations. This cost me less than ten bucks. I think it was like six ninety nine or something. You know, so anybody can get this. And um, you know, you can see the way that you, you know. I guess you, you stick a hose on this, and you know, and that's the way you know. Spray your whole yard. You know, I forget how many square feet you, know, you can do. So you will kill, spray your whole lawn, spray your whole thing. You will kill every insect in your yard, in your, in your lawn. Now, the other thing, there are other compounds um, like this um, that, um, and I'm not sure you could use this one, but they come in concentrate. You mix them in water and you buy, you can buy it. This is what the landscapers use. I think big foggers. I don't know if you've seen them or not. You know, you've done YouTube or something and you see these. But you can buy one. You can buy a propane one, which means you can take it anywhere you want. It even says on the label, take it camping. Okay? 
Can you imagine the guy coming into your campsite you know, next to you, you know, and taking out his fogger? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so these are really, you know, and you know, I, I mean, you know, there's, there's not a lot of, you know, people buying this. You know, there's not a lot of thought needed to use this stuff. It's not, you know, as long as you don't drink it, you know, you know, it doesn't harm wildlife. So that's the big key. Doesn't harm wildlife. But it kills all insects, mm -hmm. all of it, you know. And so it tells you don't spray it during the during, during the day or directly on flowers, you know, because it will kill all the bees. You know, do you think they read the label? No. You know, don't use your fogger in more than, you know, two mile an hour wind, you know, to keep it from drifting over onto your neighbor. You know, do you think they, you know, people read that stuff? If you're gonna buy this stuff, you don't know, read the labels. You know, nobody reads. So that's that's unfortunate. This is um, what is what I believe this is leading. You know what has led us to. You know is you know we hear all the time about the overuse of pesticides and the use of pesticides and, and all the different kinds of things that agriculture uses primarily. <coughs> Although we do hear sometimes about the you know like the, the chemlon people and the, you know those kinds of things that people use the herbicides. But with these pesticides, and if you're killing all insects, <clears throat> and the pair of chickadees in your yard need about six to eight thousand caterpillars to get out a clutch of young, okay, you start putting these things together, you know, and birds aren't finding the caterpillars. Why? Because, of, you know, the Jones had the graduation party the other night, you know, and fogged the yard and fogged the half the neighborhood along with it. Uh, believe me, where I come from in Rhode Island, in an heavily urban, you know, I mean, you know, urbanized areas, this is, this is commonly done. It's commonly done. And you just think about the extent to what this has done and uh, how we are all surprised that our birds are declining. Uh, it is really, uh, I, it, it's tough. And there is really nothing I can we can do about it except spread the word. You know, there's not going to be any government regulation of this. Believe me. You know, these are pesticides that don't harm Mammals or birds or wildlife or you know whatever else you know, you're thinking about. You know, we don't, you know we don't want to go back to the old days. You know we had to worry about that kind of stuff. But this is this is destroying our biodiversity. It, it's really literally doing that. So well, that's not the not the greatest thing to end with, but you know, <laughs> it is it is what I consider to be my most important uh, mission these days is to get that to get that. So, um, so I'd be glad to, uh, you know, answer more questions. Um, or, you know, glad to, um, you know, have you come up and look at the. There's some resources, field guides here, and things like that. If you're really wondering, you know, what biodiversity really is, you know, and I mean, here's the, here's the backyard bees of North America, and this is just I don't know how many there are on there, a few of them. Um, you know, there might be you know, a couple of hundred you know, bees that are, you know. Comedy be found in the backyard. And uh, this is the pollinator mix she was asking about you know, that was used uh, yeah. over there. Um, this is uh, this is uh, for people who aren't familiar with Veronica. This is a uh, uh, interesting plant that's in flower now, just to give you an idea or something. And this last is is the picture. This is the picture that was in the um, in the ad in the advert. Anything um, for sustainable. Um, this is another plant. This is a um, one that you won't find here, um, you know, for sale yet. I'm hoping yet. Um, this is this is um, New England's only native blazing star. It's called uh, uh, called New England blazing star. There's been a long argument about the taxonomy of this thing, but uh, it's found in Maine. <clears throat> and generally along the coast, it's very, uh, the most common place that I know it anyway is on Block Island. Um, but it is a blazing star and um, we have grown it from seed and this is one that 
you know, there, I did uh, grow some seed. It's a remarkable flower. It's just, you know, striking. Uh, I think I think the digital just overdid the pink just a little bit on that. But in any of that, it's a, it's a it's a, it's great because it's really our only native blazing star. You know, we all know the spicata, you know, the one that uh, grows up so far. There were a lot of, you know, out in the Midwest, there were, you know, I don't know how many, hundred different blazing stars. But this is our only New England one. Really cool. Um, so I'd like to see that. I'm trying to I'm, I'm trying to get more seed from from my contacts down to Rhode Island and see if I can get this into the trade. <laughs> Kind of fun. So, uh, any so questions? Yeah. If you had um, one reference book for people sitting here, what would it be? For us to read, uh, sort of summarizing a lot of what you've said or covering a lot of what you've said. Um. <coughs> As far as, as as far as sort of like a combination of the yeah. ecology part yeah. and the other thing, Eric Rizel's uh, Insects and Gardens. Okay. This is a great book, it's, and I probably not that many people know about it. Uh, it is uh, the two two thousand one. Uh, it's from Timber Press, uh, and he is very entertaining. They're very entertaining. Uh, 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 entomologist slash garden uh, frustrated gardener sometimes. <laughs> so you'll you know you will you'll feel a kindle, you know, but even though he's you know he's, he doesn't get he doesn't get too scientific. Yeah, I just thought of one thing. If you all want to come by next summer uh -huh. and the following summer or spring and see what this looks like. Because it's different. Three weeks ago, there were pink flowers everywhere. There were yellow flowers. I don't know what they are. They're in the backyard. I mean, every day I come out and it's something different. So feel free to just, you know, email me, jeannyrentheim at gmail.com. I'm coming by and just look at what's going to happen in a year. This is one year of doing this. And when Alicia planted the little the garden by the front door, she brought over tiny, tiny little seedlings which she grew maybe an inch tall and in one year you can see what it looks like if you go by our front door so please come back you know in a year two years three years see what this looks like i have no idea nobody has that yes um i have a question it's, it may not be so much for well i guess it is anyway uh we've got a, a large property and part of it is in current use and part of the current use forestry plan is battling invasive species, certain kinds of invasive. And they uh, are trying to get us into like pro government programs and grants and stuff to basically go through and put like 500 gallons of glyphosate in. Because that's the only way that they seem to be able to deal with this free species. They're trying to have a mountain, a certain kind of uh, uh, huckleberry that they don't like that's got. And it's like two or three things that the forest they've identified, and that's their solution. And they seem to be like kind of not happy with me. So, that came out of this. so I don't. I, I mean, I, <laughs> and so I guess you know, there's part of my philosophy is I. I mean, I have read about you know permaculture and certain things that you know the species are there because the context was there for them to arrive and to thrive. And you're kind of, it's a kind of Sisyphean path to keep pushing them away unless you have something to replace it. So I'm thinking maybe we could have to brainstorm about if I find one of these huckleberries that's not good, you know, what would you, you know, to find a kind of an analog that I could put in to replace that to become, you know, quote unquote better. Or maybe it's not worth spending energy. Yeah, this is a, this is, I didn't, I, did, I, I didn't talk about um, invasives um, mm -hmm. at all. You know, it's just, just not enough time. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it'd be worth an entire talk, but just you know, <clears throat> um, taking not we just as one example because mm -hmm. that's the one that everybody or a lot of people have issues with. Um, but I also want to talk about garlic mustard too for, for a very important reason. Um, but not we, um, <clears throat> if we really think about it, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, not weed is not is not going away. 
<clears throat> it's, it's, you know, we have, you know, the river systems, especially the ones that have just been hit for down, they're going to have even more that way. Um, it just doesn't go away. It's, it's a, you know, it's a very difficult thing. We sort of, you know, in, in, you know, you know, we, you know, we have to live with the fact that it's, you know, along our rivers and in many of the places that are on our yards. When it gets into our yards, then it's a decision that, you know, it's really up to you is how far you really want to go with it. You know, or, you know, containment is, you know, is sometimes, you know, an easier thing to do than, you know, than eradication. It's not, there are a lot, of, I could go into uh, all kinds of ideas about what you can do with that one. You know, I've made flutes out of it. You know, jam. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff you can do with it. So we have to become you know, friendlier with it. Until, you know, I don't know what the, what the biological control is going to be for that. And, you know, and, you know, and I'm certainly not going to you know, condone the use of glyphosate, no matter what anybody says. You know, but that's what the government is going to do. Tell you. Government also uses... Yeah. yeah. Well, we know where they're getting that money. Yeah. So the so the ultimate thing is that so NRCS uses glyphosate to prepare for pollinator gardens. You know, so they, they scarify an entire, you know, field or whatever, you know, and, and then, you know, you use a seed mix. You know, they don't, they don't you know, put perennials in, plugs in or anything like that, use a seed mix. You know, some of it comes up, some of it doesn't. You'll figure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have to It really depends, you know, that's the kind of thing that you need, you know, you, um, depending on the plant, you know, it could be a fungus issue, it could be a, a, an insect issue, it could be all kinds of things. And you know, the best thing for you to do really is to either take a leaf um, and, you know, bring it to your local garden center, uh, you know, and say, what do I do? Um, you know, or take a photo, you know, even better. You know, you know, if it's on your apple tree or something, take a photo of what's going on there. You know, but pretty much, because it's, it's a loaded question. It all depends on so many different things. You know, what the plant is and what the, you know, what the problem is. It could be you know, a lot of things. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Thank you. It's just a few minutes before 6.30. Okay. Yeah. Uh, garlic mustard. Um, if you, um, I'm not sure how many people, how many people know garlic mustard. Um, yeah, my wife does invasive plant control work, and she, you know, most a lot of what she does is pulling garlic mustard in the, in the yeah. spring for people. And um, the one important thing about what did I, 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 I didn't get my specimens in line. I wanted to show you two butterflies. One of them you know very well is the cabbage white, cabbage white butterfly. It's actually a butterfly, it's not a moth. Yeah, but it's, and it is our only introduced butterfly. Okay, and so that's why it's a pest. You know, because uh, there's, there's, you know, they have brought over parasitoids to, to, uh, you know, to control it. Uh, they're not greatly successful, but a couple of species of wasps. Anyway, so that's the one that you know. There's another species, the native white butterfly in, in uh, Vermont is called the mustard white, and um, I've actually saw this thing in the spring in the Green Mountains um, in spring ephemeral habitats. It comes out in April um, and is out in May, April and May, and is out in these spring ephemeral forest habitats. Really nice places. And, and so the, the, uh, the garlic mustard comes from the same place that the cabbage white does, you know, the one that's the introduced one. So the cabbage white can eat garlic mustard and not be affected by it. But the native cabbage white cannot, the larvae cannot eat that 
because it's toxic to them. And it is causing the cabbage white to become a rare species. Mm -hmm. And really the only reason I happen to find it in the Green Mountains is because we're losing it in you know, places where there are you know, outbreaks of garlic mustard. So that's another confounding. It shows, you know, this whole system of ecosystems and ecology. It's just another story. It's like, the, remember that old show, The Naked City? There's a million stories in The Naked City. Well, there's a million stories in your ecosystem. You know, and this is just, just you know, one of them of how it, you know, an invasive can be, you know, bad in so many ways. Um, it's uh, unfortunate. So that's the that's the bad side of the invasive crowd. You know, if not we we want to try to be friends with that. You know, if we can. Um, but you know, garlic mustard. We're not going to be friends with garlic mustard. We need to get rid of. This isn't a question, but I do have a recommendation, especially for you. My daughter bought me a large scale book about ten years ago called Democracy of Bees. And if you're at all interested in bees. The things you learn in this book, they are just amazing creatures. They're fascinating. I mean, it's how they communicate, how they organize the hive, how they make decisions as a hive, how the queen gets out and gets 25 million sperm that lasts for the next three years for her. It's just mind blowing. Anyway, it's democracy of bees, and uh, I don't get it. <laughs> okay, I think we're at the at the end. Uh, thank you all for coming. It was, uh, it was fun.